everybody, this is Neil Found from Clutch, and you are listening to Sonic Perspectives. to another interview of Sonic Perspectives. I'm Rodrigo Altaf, and today I'll be talking to Neil Fallon of the Maryland Rockers Clutch. Neil, how you doing? I'm well. How are you? Good, good, man. We're here in, in self-isolation here in Toronto, and I imagine you're in Maryland right now, right? Yeah, pretty much uh, the same thing. You yeah. Know, just try, trying to keep the house clean. Exactly, yeah. Well, let me start by asking you about the Weathermaker Vault series, where you're re-recording some of your old material and also bringing new cover songs. What was the idea behind that? Well, um, like a lot of rock and roll bands and heavy metal bands, where I think we've been very slow to adapt to streaming and uh, the digital world. I think rock and roll still the, the fan base of rock and roll is a very physically, um, as far as like physical albums go, they're oriented towards that. Uh, so we really wanted to kind of explore avenues to release music digitally streaming exclusively, but we didn't want to, since we didn't really know what the hell we were doing, we just decided to re-record some old songs um, and some cover songs. because that seemed like it, if it turned out to be a disaster, we would have hate to have released, you know, released a whole new album of new material. So, it, it, so there's that. And it's also just to uh, kind of bridge the gap between albums, you know, keep people engaged for lack of a better word. Right, makes sense. And uh, I love what you did to some of the old songs, Willie Nelson, Space Grass, Electric Worry. How did it feel to revisit those old songs? And I imagine it's like reconnecting with an old friend, right? Uh, it, it is. I mean, those those songs we've played, you know, for many, many years, and they've changed for many, many years, especially, you know, especially those songs that we more or less wrote in the studio or right before and th that never got Uh, tested out on the road because that always changes a song. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'd like to think we've become better players over the years. Uh, and I don't listen to our own music, you know, in my free time. So it was kind of eye opening, you know, listening to these songs for the first time in many years. It was sort of like reading an old diary entry. I imagine you found new things here and there in every song, right? Yeah, I, I think um, when you first write a song and you record it, you're more just trying to execute it properly and not having fun. But once you kn know the song backwards and forwards, you, that's when a performance can, you know, truly, you know, pop and, you know, shine. And um, it, it's easier to sing if you're not trying to remember the lyrics. If you, if you, if you have them memorized already, then you can, it kind of cuts you free a little bit. Right, I understand. And lyric-wise, do you still relate to all those songs? I mean, are you the same person who wrote those songs years ago? or? Um, you know, I think there was, for me, lyrically, there were sort of like two phases. For me, it was like the very early stuff. I still hear my teenage, you know, uh, bad attitude <laughs> in some, in some right. songs. And then later on, I uh, started write, trying to write fictions. And I think that was, uh, I'm, I'm grateful I did that because you can, I can retell a story and find something new in it every time. Um, right. I think that the songs that are more emotionally anchored to me, it's hard to relate to because, you know, people change, you know, through the course of their lives. And I'm glad I'm not the same person I was 30 years ago. Right. right. It'd be weird. Yeah, it would. And I'm asking, the reason I asked that question is because the biggest change I see in most of the songs you've re-recorded is your voice, which is much more mature and confident nowadays. Do you feel the same way about it or not? Well, thank you for saying that. Um, I, uh, for me, it was a, many years of kind of um, identity crisis, maybe, because I was always of the mind that if you were in a punk rock or a hardcore band, things like pitch and melody were to be avoided because that sounded like commercial, yeah, you know, uh, motivation. Sec secondary. And that was, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that was kind of an immature attitude to have. You know, because now I realize most of my favorite punk rock and hardcore bands, there's plenty of melody and pitch, you know. Um, and I I don't think I took it very seriously the first years because I thought it was just a, this was a temporary thing. But then I started, you know, taking guitar lessons and 
I actually took my very first singing lesson, oh, just not even two years ago. And that, that has uh, helped me immensely. And I think um, I, didn't, I didn't know, I guess we were just kind of throwing shit over the fence to see where it lands for many years. And th- this is where we've, where we've arrived eventually. Right. Okay. Uh, how do you take care of your voice these days? I imagine taking lessons like that helped you in that way as well, right? Yeah, that was the main reason to take the lessons. It wasn't a bit to like, you know, change the way I sound or to sound like anyone else in particular. It was uh, do it. You know, it's like a muscle, like any other thing in your body. You have to take care of it. You have to warm it up. Um, you know, I've tried everything under the sun, you know, all the different, you know, tinctures and, you know, teas and this and that's all pretty much psychological. What you need to do is drink lots of water, uh, exercise your voice regularly and learn the very difficult and fine art of shutting your mouth and not talking. <laughs> I imagine that's the hardest part, I guess. <laughs> It is because when, you know, if you're trying not to talk and someone wants to talk to you and shows are always very social yeah. and you don't engage back, you can come across as being arrogant or, or just a jerk. But, you know, sometimes <laughs> that's what you have to do because there's, you always have to think about tomorrow's show, not just the one that's, you know, happening right then and there. Right. Makes sense. Let me talk about the videos for a minute. Uh, you guys always seem to have so much fun doing those. I mean, Barbarella, X-Ray Visions, Burning Beard come to mind. And now Willie Nelson. Who is responsible for the concept in all those videos? Um, not us. <laughs> That's, we, uh, we've always had a kind of tumultuous relationship with videos. Um, mm. for, I think it's become easier now because things are cheaper to make. You know, just like recording music is easier Making videos is easier. Uh, I mean, we did the the hot bottom feeder and the how to shake hands video in one, both of them in one day. Oh wow! And that, that these most recent videos have all been done by a guy by the name of Dave Brodsky, and that's always his brainchild. Uh, and um, uh, X Ray Visions, or it was was it X Ray Visions? Uh, yeah, that was Dan Winters who did uh, the uh, album package for that, but. I think we found a, a really good uh, teammate in Dave Brodsky because he can turn these things out quick and it's relatively painless for us to do, which has always been the problem. We're not actors by any stretch. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, I don't know, that's my impression at least, but I think you and JP seem to embrace it a little bit more, the acting part of things for the most part. But Tim and Dan seem kind of uncomfortable at times, right? Um, I think Tim, Tim has definitely uh, warmed up to it. Uh, mm. And Dan is, I don't think he's ever liked to be around cameras, period, in any capacity. <laughs> yeah. So it's definitely, yeah, I don't think it's in his comfort zone. Uh, I'm not, you know, I don't relish it because I, I think that all four of us are fairly humble dudes. All we want to do is just play music. Um, and sometimes it, it, when we feel uncomfortable with these things, it's not because, uh, it's not really for any other reason It's that it's not, our skill set. Right. I see. Well, a funny detail about the Willie Nelson video is that you shaved your beard. Can I ask mm-hmm. why? And, and how long did you, did you groom it for? Well, um, I saved it right after the new year, basically because my son, you know, who's 10 said, or he's going to be 10 said, I've never seen your face. <laughs> I wanted to see what it looks like. So I shaved it. And like three days later, he said, can you grow your beard back, please? <laughs> funny. <laughs> So, you know, I was getting kind of annoyed with it. And, uh, I mean, the first time I grew up, had a beard was probably in 97 or something like that. And then it came off. And But this last manifestation has been there uh, probably about 15 years. So it was. I've gotten used to it. I'm probably going to grow up back. I mean, like everyone else in this um, coronavirus <laughs> situation, uh, growing one's hair out seems to be a very natural thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> well, they said that it helps with the mask if you don't have a beard. So I, I'm not sure at this point. There's so much conflicting information. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, tell me about the choice of covers for the Weathermaker Vote series. I know you did Fortunate Song from CCR, a, a Cactus song and a ZZ Top song, right? That's correct. Um, I think we just wanted to play songs that we liked. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, it's really quite that simple. These are songs that we grew up listening to. And it's, I think, 
doing cover songs is a good exercise because when you, as any band writes their own material, you're always doing it pretty much in your comfort zone, whichever comes naturally. But when you try to learn someone else's comfort zone, it can be very challenging. And even what sounds like a very straightforward song, like Fortunate Son, was a lot more challenging than I would have expected as far as, you know, the, the guitar parts. Uh, as many times as I've heard that song, you know, thousands probably, trying to figure out the little licks that Fogarty plays was really hard, and there's no straight answer on the Internet. So we just kind of said, well, you know, what? let's just make it our own to some degree. Right. Yeah, funny you say that, because a lot of bands seem to find their comfort zone in just doing covers, but you, you, you see it in a different way, right? So it was challenging for you. Yeah, it was challenging just learning, trying to get into someone's headspace. Like, if, mm -hmm. you know, if a guitar uh, phrase starts a certain way, uh, our instinct would be to end it a certain way because that's the way we do it. But someone else who wrote this, someone else. So it's it's kind of forcing you to practice music in a way you never would have otherwise. Uh, right. So, and maybe some people like cover songs because they're they're a bit of a protected play. I mean, if you write up, you know, put out an album of ten number one hits, well, then half the work is already done for you. Yeah, you, it, it's not it's not much of a chance creatively. Let's just say that. Yeah, makes sense. And tell me about uh, the Obelisk. It's an LP box set containing everything on the on this series that you're doing for Record Store Day on June twentieth, right? Um. Yeah. It's it's. it's not uh, uh, vinyl of the Weathermaker uh, Vault series. It's it's already existing vinyl uh, that we have. Oh, okay. It's, yeah, it's uh, we're not going to we we will press up the Weathermaker uh, Vault series on vinyl eventually. Uh, maybe hopefully by the end of the year. I think we need to record a few more tunes uh, to have it be of. Uh, full-blown full length but to back, back to your question yeah the uh, obelisk is uh, it escapes you everything that's in there but it's 17 discs uh some picture discs a slip mat a lithograph all put inside this one giant black box and that's why we called it the obelisk yeah you're not holding any punches with this release man it's massive i saw a picture of it it's impressive oh thank you it's, yeah. uh, what's the word i'm looking for it's reassuring that people still like physical albums and not just their phone or whatever device it happens to be convenient for them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And let me take a quick detour and ask you about the collaboration you did with uh, Vo Beat on the song Die to Live, which is great, by the way. I guess the intention was to play the song live on the tour you guys were doing uh, later this year, which is now postponed, right? That is correct. Um, we had done a tour with Volbeat you know, years ago in Europe. Um, And we've stayed in touch, you know, we've done festivals, you know, almost every, every year, every summer, we happen to be on the same bill. And uh, I got an invite from Michael to track this thing. And I did. And then it, I guess it became a single. So they, they decided to do a video. And though he and I never discussed it prior to the tour, I was always under the assumption that, that would be a, uh, a no brainer for, to do that live with them during those uh those sets and hopefully that remains the case when we reschedule these things yeah is there i mean are there talks already of when these dates can occur and i know a few south american dates were postponed or canceled as well right yeah it's a real drag because it, we've been trying to get down to south america for years and years and finally we the the stars aligned that we could get go down there go to santiago uh we had a that big festival in Mexico city and, you know, just fate dealt a different hand. Um, yeah. I can't speak about specific dates. Uh, well, one, I don't know any, and two, if I did, uh, it would, uh, I would be remiss to, to run my mouth. Um, I'm usually the last one to find out about these things anyway. So All right. I, I go on our own website to find out our tour dates. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. But as a South American myself, I mean, I'm from Brazil and I know you guys play there once at least, but mm -hmm. I hope you guys make it there because you're nowhere near as famous as you should be, you know, and going there can change things to your benefit, I hope. So uh, I hope yeah. so too. We, uh, we're going to, we're going to get back down there. You yeah. know, it's, uh, it's, it's, we're going to make it happen. Sure. Sure. And, uh, changing the subject once again, you work with Vance Powell on your last album book of bad decisions. And I remember one of the things you did was to invite him to see you on tour. 
before you went to the studio. I think that helped the end result of Book of Bad Decisions a lot, right? I, I agree, yeah, that he, uh, he has a ba his background is in live sound. Uh, so I think that he was able to see the dynamics of these songs. And, uh, you know, a perfect example would be when we were playing uh, in Walks Barbarella live. One day he, after the set, he came into the dressing room. He's like, this song needs a horn section. So there was very, very tangible uh, things that happened because he came out on the road with us. Was that the first song you did with a uh, horn section? I think so, right? Well, um, with a technically with a full section, yes. We on the Elephant Riders, there's uh, Adelphio Marsalis played on that on oh, a, a okay. number of songs, uh, but that was more kind of like a, a jazz uh, approach to the tunes. Okay, and uh, talking about Maryland Crab Cakes, <laughs> you did mm -hmm. a song called Hot Bottom Feeder in, in uh, that previous album, and you also did one about recycling bin years ago called Green Buckets. How do you explain that such weird subjects come to you? I mean, is there anything you consciously avoid or search for while writing? Um, I, I search for whatever can provide me enough <laughs> uh, <laughs> nouns and adjectives to get through the song and maybe write some story, even if I don't know exactly what it's about. Mm. That's half the fun. Um, I, for the most part, uh, try to avoid politics um, because... I like escapism in music and sometimes getting reminded of, you know, things, even if I agree with it, um, that can be a bit of a bummer. Uh, I, and I've, I've had a lot of, a lot of songs that involve cars. So I've been trying to avoid that. Oh, in, right. In the future, <laughs> just because I've beaten that to death quite a bit. Whose idea was it to put the, uh, the thing about Jimi Hendrix on the $5 bill and Bill Hicks as well? Uh, that that was myself. I was just uh, that whole song actually started as we were actually learning a, as a cover song, a Ry Cooter song called John Lee Hooker for President, which was it's, it's hysterical. He does a great Hooker imp impersonation, but I wasn't really stoked with our final product. But I liked the idea of kind of this fictional presidential campaign in in, in song form mm. and. You know, in his in his version, he talks about having you know other bluesmen in his cabinet, and so I kind of yanked that idea and made it my own. Right, very cool, very cool. And you talk about your son. I mean, he's I guess he's ten now, I believe. Do you find that uh, him being born has changed the way you write in any sense, or? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I kind of had a very naive notion that once I became a, a parent that my creative life would be over that, you know, the, somehow like the, the, my imagination would be stifled with the responsibilities of raising a human being, but it's, it's the exact opposite because <laughs> once, once you're tasked with explaining the universe to somebody, you're forced to exercise your head uh, that, in ways you wouldn't otherwise, you know, it, oh, yeah. you, you, you get so many questions that you not expecting first thing in the morning, like, Hey dad, why are most umbrellas black? <laughs> you know? That's a good one. <laughs> Stuff like that. It's like, it's a valid observation. So yeah. in some ways he's teaching me to uh, observe the, the world with new eyes again, because you can get, you know, take things for granted as every year passes by. Oh yeah. As a father of a five-year-old, I can confirm that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You understand. I absolutely, I do. Yeah. And on the topic of children, you're involved with an organization called Innocent Lives Foundation. How did that happen, and what's the organization about? Okay, the Innocent Lives Foundation is I'm, I'm a board member of it. Mm -hmm. um, and a friend of mine by the name of Chris Hadnagy, he's part of, he runs a company called Social Engineer, and they do a lot of the, the kind of the human side of hacking. And that's how, you know, he makes his bread and butter. But in the process of doing that, he was getting more and more uh, – request to help with cases of online child predators and uh, that, that kind of ugliness and realized that he knew a bunch of people with a specific skill set that could help law enforcement. Uh, and what to put it in a nutshell, the team of ILF, and I'm not part of the team. I'm only, I'm, my capacity is to help raise money, uh, but is to unmask online child predators on whatever platform they happen to be working on 
create a dossier and then hand that over to uh, the appropriate law enforcement. And it, ILF's only been, it's a charity, uh, but it's only been around for just over two years. And we, we've had dozens and dozens and dozens of cases that the team has successfully handed over to law enforcement. Where it goes from there, we, we never really know because that's not our job, but that's actually illegal. Uh-huh. Uh, all we're trying to do is um, provide the skills that so many bureaucratic law enforcement agencies just frankly don't have. Right. Well, I told you I'm a father, so I applaud you and thank you for doing this and for taking this initiative. And do, is there a website where we can donate or do you have it? At the oh, top absolutely. Of your head? Yeah. It's um, innocentlivesfoundation.org. Okay. Right. I'll, I'll place a donation as soon as this call finishes, man. I, I promise. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. I appreciate it. Uh, going back to Clutch, you guys are about to complete quite a landmark, which is your 30th anniversary. Are you planning anything special to celebrate it? <laughs> we book all these canceled shows. <laughs> that would be a start. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I, I don't think we, we are. Um, we haven't really spoken about it. We didn't for the 20th. We didn't for the 25th. And I think we've always been very kind of averse to that because we're a little bit spooked by nostalgia. We, lo- we like the idea of looking forward. Um, I think, at least me speaking personally, I think the best way to celebrate the 30th anniversary is to put out another kick-ass rock and roll record, <laughs> just like we did uh, the previous one before that. And the, the trajectory of this band, it hasn't been a sprint. It's been, it's been a long slog. It's been a marathon. And uh. we have our, our fans uh, to thank for that, that we've been allowed uh, the luxury of doing this that long. Right, and we see so many bands come and go in a span of 30 years, some of them with many lineup changes and, you know, reboots of bands like that. What would you say is the secret for your longevity and for sticking together, all, the four of you? Uh, some of it's just good old-fashioned work ethic uh, you, and, uh, and not taking it for granted and being defensive about it and realizing if you're afforded the opportunity to make a living uh, or just have a life in the creative arts, then you're a very, very fortunate person and you should be very defensive about it and not ruin it with uh vanity or yeah vanity or substance abuse or whatever i mean we we all have our our ups and downs but if you find yourself in the situation you got to treat the art like it's a baby you know that you're that you've been uh that you've been forced to adopt and um also i'd say a good sense of humor you got (laughs) to be able to laugh at yourself cool that you say that i mean the only other bands i can think of that stood together for so long is easy top and maybe rush but even rush had a changing lineup after the first record so props to you for looking at it this way man oh, thank you yeah uh, do you have any regrets or anything you would have done differently i mean what would the new felon of today say to the new felon of 1991 if you could i do have one i think about it quite often uh i wish i had written everything down and oh. kept a, a diary and a journal of even the most boring days on the road um, or in the studio it, because I never thought it would last this long. And I, my memory is pretty terrible. And it would, would have been nice for me to have a document to look back and, and remember uh, how these things change so slowly. But over the course of 30 years, a lot has changed. Um, but that's what I would tell myself. Don't be so damn lazy. <laughs> Oh, man. So no chance of an autobiography anytime soon or? Um, no. <laughs> if it is, I've got to make up a lot of stuff because I don't remember anything. Fill the blanks, right? <laughs> it's the, I'm like the opposite of Keith Richards. Oh, man. <laughs> That's a shame. I would love to read that bio. But anyway, <laughs> moving on. Uh, I have a kind of a weird question. You, you guys have opened for many metal bands like uh, Slayer, Pantera, Iron Maiden, etc. Do you find that you're usually embraced by the metal crowd or do you guys have a hard time at shows like that? It depends. I, I think it's changed quite a bit. I mean, I think metal used to be much more conservative and much more, uh, you know, folded arms across the chest. Because if you didn't look it and you didn't sound it, then they wanted nothing to do with you. But then now we can go to these huge metal fests, like, for example, Hellfest, and we don't look it, we don't sound it, but people love it. I think people have become more open-minded uh, in some regards. Because I remember growing up, I mean, it's so stupid in hindsight when you think like, oh, someone with a shaved head should go go to the metal show because the long hairs are going to beat them up or <laughs> vice versa. I and mean, how ridiculous that sounds now. Um, but then again, maybe that's still the case. I just don't go to those shows. Um, right. But uh, we always found it easier to get, you know, metal bills and hardcore bills than anything else. So here we are. 
Right. Funny you should say that because the first time I saw you guys was in a festival in Australia and you guys played just before Anthrax. I was there actually for Anthrax and when you guys started, I was like, who are these guys? You know, flannel shirts and everything. But mm. then I stopped and listened and I fell in love with the band after the first song. So, oh, right on. Yeah. So what's the plan right now? I mean, I know you have all these canceled shows or postponed shows, but are you thinking about a new album already or... Uh, we are. We're, we're, we've started kicking around riffs that's kind of put on hold. I think we're all going to have to just do that at home for a while. Uh, I would love, love, and I know we all would love uh, for there to be an album this time next year. Right. So I love the previous one. I don't know if you read my review, but it was a glowing review, of course. I think you're on, a, on an upward trend with uh, Earth Rocker, Psychic Warfare, and the last one. So I hope you guys can keep that trend. I, I hope so too. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. Thank you so much for your time and stay safe out there. You too. Thanks, man. Take care. Yes. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. Okay, folks, that's a wrap. And I hope you enjoyed this chat with new Fallon of Clutch. Just so you know, this interview is also available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and iHeartRadio. As always, we ask that you support us by following us on Twitter and Facebook and by subscribing to our YouTube channel. We're going to finish off now with the song Willie Nelson, re-recorded by Clutch as part of their Weathermaker Vote series. Take care and rock on! Rock on!